Hello. Yes. What is that? Yanta speakers? Hello? Check one, two, mic one. Hello? 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 No. Hello? Hello? Yes. Test one, two. Audio check.
testing audio audio check audio check testing audio audio check It's fully working, so. Mine is working, looks like. Mine? Yeah, mine's fine. Hear me?
Carolina, you still having problems? Okay, I'll try to see if I can find it here. Uh, so I have. I have presentation Jan Carolina, and then I also need the one from last night, no? Carolina? Okay. And we have the, the one from last night is the first one, and the other one is at, is at the end. Carolina, the, the introductory slides are up on the screen here. I don't know if you see them on your screen. Yes, yes, we can see them. Okay, so, so you just tell me when to move the, move the slide and I will. All right then, I think we're ready to begin. Um, before we start, um, if you would like to move up, I don't think there are going to be lots more of us um, to have a more interactive conversation, please do, if you still... COVID separated, I understand. Um, just to welcome you all um, to this uh, very, very interesting session that we have here this morning. Um, the session is actually the name of the book, just to make sure that everybody uh, is in the right session. Um, the um, session is title is the title of the book, and um, it's about, about to be launched. It's uh, Digital Data, Polycentric Governance Perspectives and it's co-edited by Carolina Aguera, Al Malcolm campbell Verdane, and Jan Art um, Skolch, Skolch, Tim. Um, and they are fortunately with us today, um, Jan in the room, and Carolina um, and uh, others on, 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 online. I know it's sort of three or something in the morning for Carolina in Argentina, so um, thanks very much for, for people who are not in our time zone. Um, for joining this really interesting session, or hopefully will be interesting session, because the book um, very uh, squarely addresses the issues of uh, data governance and privacy, particularly as it relates to existing data governance frameworks in different sectors, and the sub-issues with, within the theme of the, the, it's this session. The volume examines how digital data are governed. The literature to date understands data and governance very differently across academic and policy fields. Um, including in the scholarship and the policy surrounding internet governance. No book has yet linked together in productive conversations the varying approaches to data governance. Polycentrism, this book shows, provides a set of perspectives for understanding the growing variety of actors, issue areas and processes at the sub-national, national, regional and global levels that are crucial to cooperation and digital governance. So it's really, really very exciting to have um, the authors of the chapters of this book um, speaking today. What we'll do is, instead of running through them all now, as people speak, we will introduce them so that you can link them to their chapters and books. But um, just to, before we um, hand over, just to return to the issue of um, the very uh, interesting application of polycentrism to uh, data governance and to, and to privacy. Um, I think, you know, as the, as the book suggests, there's been a lot of interest for a long period of time in polycentrism. Uh, we've seen uh, a considerable literature in the, in the area of the commons, um, drawing on Ostrom's work, and particularly in re regard to regulation of natural resources. Um, we've seen the very interesting extension of um, Ostrom's work and with Ostrom by Brett Frischman in the area of uh, spectrum regulation and then most recently internet. But there hasn't been a stronger emphasis on um, the global dimensions now of uh, governing these what are essentially global digital public goods um, and the really enormous governance challenges. So the, the application that's been done has firstly not been that much to, um, as I said, we recently see internet, but it's still looking at 
basically national governance systems and not really addressing this enormous challenge we now have of global governance. And polycentrism, because it is looking at uh, managing complex systems, and in this case of um, data and of the internet and of global systems, these complex adaptive systems. So you need very agile institutional range, um, institutions that can adjust, adjust to these very fast changing environments. And you need to have coordination at a global level that presents an entirely new challenge for us. So the book is very timely in, in this sense. And um, uh, really looking forward to uh, having a, a, a hopefully a fruitful discussion on this. So let me move straight into the discussion and, um, or not into the discussion, but into the, the presentation by um, uh, Jan and Carolina. And um, we'll, t we'll take it from there. Jan is in the room and will be presenting and um, Carolina is online. Carolina. Malcolm, ah, oh, sorry, we couldn't see the screen. It's on the screen. Please carry on. Malcolm, just Malcolm, sorry, uh, at the risk of waking your, your dear little ones, could you talk a little bit louder? We're on maximum volume in the room here, but just a little bit quiet.
I think that'll that'll be uh, me to spare Carolina having to have huge intellectual energy at three in the morning in uh, in Uruguay. Um, yeah, so just to give a, a, a brief introduction to this notion of polycentrism. I think maybe you're more familiar to, in talking about debates of governing digital in terms of fragmentation. And there's lots of debates about unity, uh, unification and fragmentation in governance of the internet. It's technical layer, um, it's data and content aspects. Uh, but as you've probably found when you use this term fragmentation, it's often quite difficult to figure out exactly what is being meant and what is being said. And it often turns out to be not a very analytical kind of dis discussion and becomes rather more loose and so on. So this concept of polycentrism in a way is a way to bring in some academic ideas about how governing works um, and then hopefully to bring some greater clarity and precision to the way we talk about governing uh, internet issues and in this case uh, data. Uh, the argument is, in a way, that it's not, it's not a question about unity or fragmentation, but actually it's a, it's, a, it's a mix of the two, and you see that in this concept, polycentrism. Poly, many, multiple centers, multiple places where rules about data are being made, but centrism, meaning it's not all totally chaotic. There is an order, there are, there are norms and structures of power that bring a, bring a certain cohesion to the whole, even though at the level of actors it seems like it's a very messy situation. So the chapters that are, that are going to be discussed here are going to talk about different substantive areas, different issue areas, and, and applying this general notion that we have many centers that are doing the governing of data, but at the same time they are ordered in, in some way. Then I'll come back at the very end after you've heard the different uh, sessions, the different uh, cases, um, and then try and tie it together a little bit uh, more uh, at the end, and hopefully then these initial comments make even well, more sense or less nonsense than they have at the moment. So, uh, Carolina, is that okay for a start, or would you like to add anything else from your side? Thank you very much, uh, Carolina. Um, and I think that's going to provide a, a wonderful basis for the discussion of the um, next uh, chapters that we're going to be um, looking at. And I think just from that discussion, I mean, besides the sort of multiple centers of decision making, the, the challenge of governance is there needs to be some levels of, of coordination between the competition and the collaboration. And, um, you know, what are the forms of governance that actually hold that together is kind of the critical question that, that faces us. So um, wonderful position to start for the chapter that's done by Wenlong Li on strengthening data protection enforcement. Is European Data Protection Board, the EDPB, um, the end of polycentric governance between DPAs, data protection authorities, uh, um, or a new beginning? Wenlong Li. Okay, we'll move on to, sure, we'll come back to that. Let's move on to um, Dimitri Epstein, who's going to speak about polycentric privacy governance. I think he's uh, joining us um, from, from Israel. So, um, Dimitri, good morning, and please go ahead. Dimitri, can you just check your sound, and we'll check sound this side. Yes, we can. Thank you. Thank you. 
Dimitri, I'm sorry to do this to you as well. Clearly, you all don't have very muted tones, but we can't hear you loudly. We can hear you, but not very loudly. And apparently, the system is on this maximum here. So if I could just ask you to, to speak up. Thank you. You're, you're given you're given license to shout, uh, Dima.
Rotem, thank you very much for that. Um, Dimitri, I'm going to have to ask you to speak very, very quickly or very, very short. <laughs> Please, thank you. Dimitri. Dimitri, I'm afraid we're not going to have time to summarize. We have to keep these presentations. We've got a hard stop. Um, please, if the other presentations also, if we can keep it just to those five minutes, please. Thanks so much. Um, not at all. We'll, we'll, we'll come back to this discussion, hopefully, if we've got time to discuss. Can we go back to uh, Wilong Li and see if she's been able to connect? Uh, oh, goodness. Oh, dear. Well, I think that's a very nice practical example of what we're facing, um, sadly. 
Um, if we could please uh, then just go on to uh, the presentation by uh, Clara Iglesias Keller and Bruna Martins Dos Santos, who's with us in the room and I think we'll be doing the presentation while she sets that up, chases and trackers, regulatory challenges in disinformation datafication. Thank you very much. And hello, everyone. Um, hope you hear me well. Um, first of all, um, it's also a pleasure to be here, a pleasure to be part of this work. Um, Clara told me, asked me to also let her, let you guys know that she was really looking forward to be here, but she couldn't do to other um, work commitments. Um, but talking about the, the chapter itself, um, our chapter goes on about um, basically disinformation and data regulation. So the, it, the, the main goal of that is to explore the intersection between data governance and digital transformation, also uh, digital disinformation, sorry, also referred as we refer to just like this information. Um, and the goal is to also demonstrate how comprehensive approaches to the to disinformation and data governance itself can allow for um, regulatory um, assessments on, on regulatory strategies that were proposed um, recently on the topic of um, halting or fighting um, this info. Um, we use here, um, we, go, we also um, elaborate a little bit about the versatility of data um, and, and how this is represented um, throughout the debates. Um, we do trust that this information is a polycentric issue that originates from and is shaped um, by different centers of information production and decision making. Um, but also, we are also we're meaning to highlight um, the versatility of regulations themselves because we understand they can go um, both ways. Um, and when we talk about both ways, we focus on what we said, um, what we spoke about a little bit on the um, trackers and the chasers. And um, when we talk about the trackers themselves, um, we're talking about the regulation of traceability. So basically finding means of tracing content back to the author um, through the expansion of personal data collection um, mandates or um, any tools in that sense. Um, and here in this, in, in this part, like we highlighted both the cases of Brazil and India um, who recently have discussed or deployed um, traceability measures um, regarding messaging apps itself. Um, Brazil was debating the um, fake news um, draft bill um, in this past three years that was um, very um, heavy on the traceability measures. But um, we also shine a light on the DSA, the Digital Services Act, um, as it did um, bring in a little bit of discussion on um, traders' trace traceability. So um, the idea was to expand um, the data collection on traders whenever an online platform could allow consumers to conclude um, distance contracts with them. So it's basically like um, centering um, the, the kind of the, um, how anybody could um, buy in or, or um, announces or anything like that. When we go to the chasers, um, the second part um, of our debate, we are also talking about um, the regulation of political micro-targeting. Um, Cambridge Analytica here seems as one of the breaking points for um, for what we are calling nowadays a regulation of political micro-targeting or even establishing a connection between these practices and the dissemination of this information. So this, this connection to us is rather important. Um, and also because um, the data that informs political micro-targeting is likely to include um, sensitive um, personal data, so ethnicity, ideologies, um, political and religious beliefs, so amongst other type of information. So all of this information is data upon which users could be discriminated and also information that can be sensitive in many jurisdictions, not just the Brazilian one. Um, and, and last but not least, um, we do understand that this can be a subject that could fall upon um, this intersection between electoral systems or electoral regulation and, and this info. But um, we also um, talk a little bit about that database political advertisement has been at the core or could be at the core of this information strategies in different um, national contexts and does raise a lot of concerns or even um, helps highlight the concerns about um, citizens' data protection and privacy. And um, just to bring in a lot of, uh, another example, I think um, Brazil in the recent years 
has been a, a good place where these um, practices have been um, at least um, social media platforms and throughout a lot of um, other spaces. And um, this is, is pretty much it um, from us. We do um, talk a lot about um, the, this regulatory target data as a regulatory target for this information policy. And, and we do contemplate um, different as aspects between both trackers and chasers. But um, I guess I'll, I'll give the floor back to Alison. Thank you. Well, that is so interesting, Bruno. I do hope we do get back to some discussion there. But we'll immediately go on to Malcolm Campbell, the Dane. Um, to tell us about the distribution of distributed governance, power, instability, and complexity in polycentric data ordering. Alison, and just for the records, Venlong finally managed to get into the room. So um, after Malcolm, we will have uh, Venlong. Okay, I'll be um, very loud and very short then to give space to others. Uh, so hopefully you can hear and see the slides and everything. So. Yeah, just really quick, uh, this is a chapter that's assessing the kind of novelty and effectiveness of uh, so-called distributed data governance that, uh, you know, exemplified most prominently by Bitcoin, but also this kind of wider, seemingly ever-growing set of experiments with its uh, underlying uh, so-called distributed ledger technology. So uh, this includes all these efforts to distribute data on cryptocurrency uh, transactions, but also users. And uh, all this is kind of important for the underlying technologies uh, growing application, as I mentioned, from everything from like digital art to sports with uh, fan tokens uh, that we're seeing in the World Cup being traded right now. And then even more broadly as part of the emerging uh, so-called Web3. So um, yeah, the question here is about how can we understand and assess claims to the novelty and effectiveness that are arising from this set of attempts um, since about 2009 to distribute uh, data governance. And what I do is first situate uh, Bitcoin and experimentation around it within longer lineages and contexts that I argue uh, help to contest the so-called novelty around uh, these efforts to distribute data governance. And then in a second related step, I'm showing how these efforts are kind of reproducing rather than resolving uh, problems of instability, power concentration, and uh, uh, complexity and data governance more generally. Um, and so I get to these arguments uh, by focusing on three structures of polycentric data ordering that I'll let uh, Jan and Carolina expand on a little bit more in a second. Uh, but just the kind of headline takeaway is that all these um, features of polycentric theorizing can help us to better make sense of what I've called the kind of chaos or that seems to be the chaos of cryptocurrency and other experiments in uh, distributed data governance through these three structures. Um, and that, yeah, we can get a better understanding of basically how polycentrism provides a useful lens more generally for understanding data governance in motion. So how these evolving projects that are all trying to do different things, in this case, distribute data governance uh, and are going about things in so many different directions at once that it can be kind of hard to make sense of them well, polycentrism offers this kind of big picture view of the novelty and effectiveness of all these efforts and what they actually mean uh, beyond kind of hot air. It's interesting hot air, but a lot of it is still hot air. So I'll, I'll just end there and thank you for your time and go over to uh, Wen Long if that's possible. Thank you so much for that, uh, Malcolm. That was nice and, and brief, but I hope we get back to those discussions. Hopefully they'll also be picked up by um, Carolina and Jan who are now going to come back with um, a paper, their chapter on polycentric attributes in global digital data ordering. Oh yes, sorry, We've, we managed to get Wen uh, Long Lee back on, so I think we'll do that first because the um, final chapter is also the framing chapter for the book, so, let's just, so we'll come back to that. Wen Long Lee, please go ahead, I'm so glad you could join us. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, and my sincere apologies for not showing up in time. I, I got locked out of this room for not being able to, to give the correct credentials. Um, so my research um, is refers to a particular type of polycentricity. Uh, I think it's distinct from, for instance, Markham says about uh, a distributed ledger or something else. Um, it is essentially the, the interplay 
between uh, national authorities in the EU in the context of data protection. So basically, it's a kind of what I would call a polycentric structure of data protection enforcement. And there are some interesting developments recently by the um, European Data Protection Board, I think, may have made some changes to the current layout. So um, there's something, um, I think, happening or shifting on the spectrum that is currently on display uh, between a fully decentralized model, which was like 20 years ago when there was no digital GDPR, but only the Data Protection Directive, towards something different. I think no one has articulated what it is, but it is something that is going on. Um, so I, I think it's important to, to characterize data protection enforcement in Europe, Elizabeth. I think it has been shifting over the years from a fully decentralized uh, position uh, back in 1990s. Uh, towards something what the European Data Protection Supervisor would call a, a, a kind of EU approach to data protection. And in between, this is what currently we have, a kind of uh, polycentric model of data, uh, data protection. So maybe I don't have time to go through the detailed layout, but this is a kind of a visualization of how uh, this polycentric model is designed and implemented uh, uh, by the EU institutions. We can see there's a kind of one-stop shop mechanism that has received quite a lot of criticism late lately because of the inaction of the Irish Data Protection Commission. Uh, and also there's a, a, a mechanism called joint investigations where multiple authorities might intervene simultaneously. And also there's a other that I don't have time to unpack. For instance, the consistency mechanism, the urgency procedure, and uh, mutual assistance, which are all prescribed under the chapter seven of the GDPR. So I will conclude with some probably three observations. The first is that the, um, the, the one-stop shop is uh, pretty prioritized by the EU, but has been broken. So there has to be some kind of fix to it. And maybe I think as a trend, um, um, the entire structure of data protection enforcement may be more polycentric uh, in, in the way that um, more authorities can give the autonomy and the authorities to intervene rather than just, you know, putting all the eggs into one basket. Um, at the same time, somewhat paradoxically, I think the enforcement in the EU is less polycentric as well, in the sense that ED, the EDPB acts not just as a, a coordinator, uh, but also an ultimate adjudicator and uh, kind of powerful agent setter. So if you look at the recent guidelines, you will see that although the, the, the terms are quite carefully drafted, but it seems towards a, a kind of more centralized model, which has uh, significant ramifications for data protection enforcement in the EU. So I'll probably just stop there here. Thank you so much, Xuan Longli. Um, if we can go straight very quickly to uh, Carolina and Jan. Great, so thanks uh, very much. Um, I will try to talk while I go to the... There we go. So what, you, what you've heard from these different um, uh, chapters is looking at different areas of data governance. We've heard about uh, disinformation, we've heard about data protection in a couple of, of, uh, of, the, of the contributions, uh, we've heard about blockchain. Um, all different aspects of data governance, but I think you, if you listened to the different uh, presentations, you would have heard some common threads. Uh, common thread was that in each case there were multiple actors that were involved in the governing. So it wasn't one governing, but it was multiple. 
So uh, we heard about uh, 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 transgovernmental networks of data protection officers together with the European Union, together with national governors, together with school administrators in the first paper. So there's lots of rules coming from lots of different places. And uh, then on the disinformation, <coughs> we heard about the, the chasers um, as well as the trackers. Um, some of them are in, in government, some of them not in government, fact-checking networks, and, and it all very decentered in, in that sense. Um, with blockchain, yeah, it's the peer-to-peer -peer networks and the, the notion that, that, that it's going off in lots of different directions, but then states and governments are trying to get into the crypto regulation game as well. So each time we're seeing multiple, multiple actors coming across, and we're finding that those actors are both in the public sector as well as in the private non-governmental area. In each case, it looks quite messy. It's not a neat pyramid with a nice authority at the top. Uh, yesterday, we, I, I heard a, a, a presentation on data governance, and they were looking for, let's have a place, a centralized place in, inter, in, in international organizations where we can negotiate all of this. But if you've heard what you've heard here today, there are literally tens of thousands of actors that are involved in this data governance. The idea that there will be one place where everyone will come together and sort out all the problems is not going to happen. So then the question is, how, how are we going to live with this? We can either hope for these ideas of digital sovereignty, which are somehow have this illusion that there's going to be one place of all the control, or we have to say, no, we're actually going to live in a situation with Actors, oh, I seem to have lost my, uh, you are screen sharing, but it's not seeing, showing for you. Okay. You carry on and I'll... Uh, but in any case, what, what we can identify in all of these cases, then the polycentric governing, seven features of it. One, it operates across different scales. So you've got local actors, national actors, regional actors, global actors. So the polycentrism works across different scales of regulation. It also operates, secondly, across different sectors. So you have both public and private and hybrid public-private actors. So you've got the going across sectors. It's diffuse, it's scattered, it's, it's all over the place. It's not centered in one place, but it's scattered across. You have situations of fluidity too, that every moment almost, the, the regulations are changing and the, and the apparatuses of regulation are changing. So it's very hard to keep track of it all. It's also a case where many actors sometimes have overlapping mandates. They all claim that they're the one who should be dealing with this. So there's not a neat division of labor in the regulatory tasks. There's also unclear hierarchies. It's not clear who's ordering who around a lot of the times. This came out in one Long Lee's uh, presentation. Yeah? The national governments on the one hand, the European Union on the other, and they're interacting, but it's not really clue clear who's ordering who around. Um, and in that situation, uh, again, no final arbiter, no final president of global data governance, and it's not going to happen. So some, you might say, well, this looks really messy, but you could say it has positive aspects as well. It has possibilities of creativity, it has possibilities of uh, innovation, it has possibilities of adaptation, flexibility. So there's a lot of possibilities, and uh, yet people get worried about the coordination but maybe messy governance isn't always a bad thing. I mean, life is messy, so why, don't, why shouldn't we expect data governing to be messy as well? Um, and out of that, maybe we do get some, some, some various solutions. But then we have to learn to live with the, with the, with, with the, with the chaos. Um, and we will see that, that, that the chaos does uh, have various ordering principles. And in the book, we go through the kinds of overarching norms, overarching structures that actually do give quite a bit of order to all of this mess. Um, and that emergent norms and, and emergent practices and underlying structures may actually give us more order than we think. Um, but for the rest, yeah, relax. Well, uh. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jan. Um, Carolina, please don't relax too much because we've got to finish the session quite quickly. If we could please have your input. And I hope you're still awake at those early hours of um, the morning in Argentina. 
Thank you, Alison. I'm, I'm, I think that Jan has uh, summarized neatly. I mean, our our chapter is um, a contribution that addresses is it, it it is based on a previous concept, conceptualization um, uh, that Jan elaborated in 2017, addressing polycentric attributes in internet governance. And here we are bringing in the data governance dimension very much into uh, the uh, internet um, infrastructure. Uh, so. Um, we work along these dimensions and it is one of the first chapters of, of the book. I also want to say that the book has a contribution of, uh, has 11 chapters uh, as part of the um, of the final layout and we hope to have this book launched uh, in the early months of 2023. Thank you all for being here and um, as remote moderator as well, I'm encouraging anyone who's online to send their questions and comments. Thanks very much, um, Carolina. I'm actually not going to do any kind of um, summing up. We had such a nice discussion and we had an earlier um, fr disc framing discussion that was very, very useful. Um, I just do want to pose one question as we ask questions so that it can be gathered up um, because I think, um, yes, indeed, Jan, it's messy and there's potential um, for self-organization. Um, I just wanted to flag you kind of suggesting that there may be some kind of normative coherence that maybe is coming out of this. And I, I just want to suggest that I don't see any normative coherence. In fact, I, I see you know, enormous you know, regional blocks and thing, these kinds of things. But, you know, what, are you suggesting something else? Um, but I think you're just, you've really highlighted, you know, there was already um, polycentric complexity to data protection governance on its own. And a lot of that's been equated with kind of broader data governance, but we've seen here how, how much more to data governance there is than data protection. Um, and this raises these big, big issues of, of, of global co governance, not necessarily coordination, but global governance. How do we address them? Because if you, um, you know, suggest that, well, we can't have anything else other than messy. I think what you are likely to see is the, pro, you know, dominant interests prevailing under those circumstances. So my question is really, what does that mean for developing countries? We're already marginalized from global, you know, standard setting, decision making, etc. Under this, does this create opportunities for, you know, developing countries to coordinate activities or to do something um, in the international global system, or more likely actually be the um, subjects again of, of, of various processes, not only formal global governance processes, at least their exclusion is acknowledged from, but from other systems in which they are completely invisible. Can we go from there to a quick round of questions in the room? Yes, please. Okay, uh, uh, thank you very much for giving me this chance for raising my uh, concern or issues regarding to this uh, policy intrigue uh, data governance approach. Well, uh, ideally, uh, I greatly appreciate uh, the approach because it's looking at the general ecosystem nature. But as the complexity is increasing, and we need to raise two, two dimensions regarding to this one. The first is how trust, the trust model could be entertained in this policy intrigue approach. The second is capability. As one, something is getting more complex, uh, it requires high capability of managing, controlling, regulating everything. But uh, countries and continents have different level of capability. So how the capability could should be, be entertained in this one. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, any more questions from the floor here? Carolina, sorry, but we've got one more question, Carolina, and then I, I think you can take over with the online questions. Hi, my name is Giovanna. I'm a researcher from Brazil, currently studying um, polycentric um, governance. So thank you all for the presentation. Um, as a researcher from the Global South, I have a question that is really similar to what um, you, the moderator, has um, pointed out. And then complementing it is more, how could these countries in this messy, um, decentralized ecosystem deal with the asymmetry of resources and of information if we if we consider that as professor Jan pointed out um, that this messy environment can be beneficial somehow for a global governance thank you thank you so much um, let's move to you uh, Carolina Alison we don't have any questions in the zoom Okay, great, because we don't have much time. So let me ask the panelists and um, we'll just start in the room. 
Um, Bruno, would Yeah, more like a, an added comment on this as well. Like, I think um, Brazil has recently discussed uh, data protection regulation. We discussed it around, um, started in 2008 and in 2018. And what you were just saying, like this, um, this mainstreamed or even like very Eurocentric approach to data protection is still very present in our regulation. And whenever somebody um, is trying to discuss new re regulatory regimes, such as the DMA and the DSA nowadays, you, you see a lot of academics and policymakers talking about the tropicalization of this as well. So, I mean, I guess there's also a question about like how much of these um, regulatory frameworks are we actually like analyzing and willing to adapt in, in spite of the different um, structures, the different um, judicial systems and, and things like that? Because these ideas, they can sound really interesting. Um, and especially like if you look at the GDPR, um, this is definitely a very um, user-based um, and interesting approach to regulation itself. But I, I also think that beyond um, just the interesting ideas, it also talks about a lot um, on us willing to adapt this to our local realities and context and not just um, reproducing um, regardless of, of what could happen. So I, I do share the same doubts and concerns and also speaking from, from somebody from the global south or as some would like to say, the majority of the world or things like that. So thank you. Thanks very much for that, Bruna. I'm going to quickly go online because I think they may just cut off our link um, and, and then we'll come back if there's time, Jan, into the room. So, Carolina, um, uh, let's just start with um, uh, uh, Dimitri and Rot Rotem. Do you want to have a quick response? Sure. Um, I think so, like, there are a lot of thoughts uh, provoked by this conversation. Um, I kind of want to pick on this point um, that Jan made about uh, kind of adopting the messiness, right? It's not this is can you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, OK, so um, I think it's kind of it's a fundamental shift in thinking because when we talk about even like governance or global governance, there's kind of an assumption where right, there can be like a single, you know, governance framework. Right. And I think uh, the argument here is kind of push to push against it. And I would and I wonder whether we, especially like as researchers, should perhaps focus more attention on like studying the norms and practices and underlying structures. Uh, because whereas there may be not a single set of norms uh, kind of globally that we can kind of converge around, right? Uh, at least like in our research, we see a very strong impact of this kind of implicitly practiced norms when, you know, street level bureaucrats act as mediators or regulatory mediators um, in, you know, enacting privacy in our case. And I think perhaps understanding what norms are being enacted may be a step towards kind of understanding a little bit of orderness in this mess. I'll stop here. Thanks very much, um, Dima. Can we ask Malcolm if he's got a few parting words? Great. Yeah, thank you. Um, hopefully you can hear me. Um, yes, I'd maybe just pick up on uh, Dima Faime's points um, about how polycentrism enables us to see also the relation between those three features. So like in the case of crypto, at least you have these, you could say, useful norms of preserving privacy, of allowing possibilities for, you know, democratization of finance and everything. Um, but also you have these crypto colonial practices and you have these underlying orders of you know, very extreme libertarian capitalism at the same time, right? So what this lens allows us to see is how these kind of go hand in hand. And sure, there's opportunity, but there's also massive risks, right? For the global south, developing countries, et cetera, right? So you need to understand these and how they go together. And that's what this lens, you could say, provides through the chaos of crypto in that case. I'll Thank you so there. much for that. My kids <laughs> Thanks, Malcolm. Um, Wen Long Lee? Afraid that's what I suspected. Sorry to those online. Um, Jan, they're actually going to clear the room, but if you want to just talk while people move in and out, please go ahead. Sure. No, just a, 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 just one general comment. There, I think two 
broad concerns that come out again and again in relation to this polycenter governing. And when I said relax, it was about the first concern, which is about coherence, coordination and control. I think when people say we want to have one neat framework so that we can have exact predictability and regularity about governing data, that's not available, it's not going to be available and we need to learn to live with that. The other concern which Alison and others have brought up is about the power concern. The, the, the pretension that somehow because it's polycentric it's not hierarchical, that, it's, that there aren't dominant and, and subordinate powers and that there are major problems about accountability in these arrangements, that there are major problems about uh, special interest capture. Uh, this is clearly so, and that there are major problems of subtle structural power, not only north-south, but in relation to gender and race and other aspects. This is clearly the case, and that's why we want to say, look at structured polycentrism, look at the structures of the polycentrism, look at the norms, look at the practices, look at the underlying structures, and you'll find a lot more coherence then. It's not the coherence in the sense of neat, neat consistent policies, but it's pretty consistent in terms of the power hierarchies, and those we, we really need to expose and, uh, and, and struggle against. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jan. Um, please extend our regrets to your colleagues, who I think briefly came online for a next session, so we'll have to move out of here. Thank you so much all and um, yeah, thank you for the really, really interesting inputs. Thank you.